Okay. Hi and welcome to the fourth lecture in the course Programming and Data Structures at Linnaeus University. Uh, the course is named Programming and Data Structures and today we are actually going to have a lecture about data structures. The most simple data structure, I will name them and describe these data structures and I will also tell you two different ways of implementing them. So the topic for today is first to give an overview of a few common data structures. You have seen them earlier on, a list and a stack and a queue. These are the simple data structures. Uh, I will try to explain more in detail what we actually mean by a data structure and then I will point out two different ways of implementing them. You can use an array as your backup storage structure. This is the one approach we have used so far, but you can also use something called a linked approach to implement the data structures. And finally, I will say a few words about Java doc documentation. Yeah. But in general, quite often when we are programming, we need to handle large data sets. For example, students in a course, measurements from an experiment, queue to get an apartment at our campus, the telephone numbers in Stockholm. Uh, these are different scenarios and different scenarios often require that we are using different data structures. For example, some of the scenarios might say that data should be ordered. We should have them in some kind of alphabetic order or something like this. Uh, it might be that we should not have the same element twice. For example, queue to get an apartment, you shouldn't be at two different positions in the queue. You should only have one position in the queue. Uh, important that lookup is fast. For example, the telephone numbers in Stockholm. Uh, if you want to look up the telephone number of someone, it should run rather quickly. We shouldn't have to iterate over the whole list to look for someone. We must come up with a more clever way of doing it. So, selecting a data structure uh, is what we are saying. It's a design decision. You will see that there are many different data structures and they can also be implemented in different ways. Uh, so, uh, uh, and what type of data structure you are using, it might have a large impact on the performance of your program. You will later on see that, for example, sorting a number of items, it can be done very quickly and it can be done rather slowly as well. So if we start to have billions of data, then selecting data structure is really important. It can make a whole difference uh, for the performance of the program also. And also, I say that selecting data structure is important for program comprehension. Uh, the ease of understanding a program. If someone has written a program and they are using a list for everything. List is a rather general concept. You can add and remove things everywhere. Uh, rather than um, they are using a list, but actually they are using it as a, a queue then they are using a much more general data structure for their actual need and it makes the code, code harder to read. So if you want to use a data structure as a queue, then you should, should select a queue. You shouldn't select a more general one. Um, here are a number of different data structures. Um, they are in blue here on a rather dark background, so I'm not sure whether you can read them. Can you read them? List, queue, stack, deck, set, map tree and graph. Do you recognize this? A list, we have talked about list, I've used this as an example many times. A queue, well you know what a queue is. You, you add yourself in the end and you remove something in the front. A stack, we have also talked about this one. Uh, you add and remove at the same uh, end of the pipe. A deck is a double-ended queue. You know what you can do with this one? You can add and remove at both sides uh, of it. And then we have a set. And this is one is slightly different. It is, it's, it's not a sequential one. Uh, it's a collection not containing the same element twice. If you try to add the same element a second time to a set, it will be ignored. They are not caring about this second attempt of adding it. Uh, and then we have map. Uh, we are working with key value pairs. You are adding the name and the telephone number. So you're adding a pair of data. 
One is called the key and the other one is called the value. It might be your name and your telephone number. So put, we are adding the pair, get means give me the corresponding value for the key. It's for looking up things. It's called a, a map or a table. It's, it's to look up things. We have a tree. It has a root and you can think about the file system on your hard drive. C colon is the root of your file system and it contains other ones in different levels. So they are ordered as a tree with a C colon as it's a, the root of the file system. It's the topmost uh, uh, director in your computer. And the most general one which we will not discuss in this course is called a graph. A graph comes with nodes and binary relations which are called edges. For example a road map with cities might be the nodes and the roads connecting the cities might be the edges. So this is a, a more complex data structure and it will be dealt with later on in your second year of studies, the graph data structure. Yeah. A short uh, description of the different data structure that I just mentioned. Yeah. The simplest one are the stack and the queue. I always think of them as a pipe where you can only do operations on one end of the pipe. And in the case of the stack, we are doing all operations on one side. Push means adding a new one to the stack. Peak means take a look at it, but not removing it. Pop means remove the first one. Uh, if you are pushing a number here, you are pushing all the other numbers one step backwards. It's called last in, first out, since the last added element is the first one that you're picking out with a push operator. Do you understand how it works? Yeah. Uh, similar uh, is the queue. DQ means remove from the queue. NQ means add one at the end of the queue. So we are adding elements in one end of the data structure and we are removing elements from the other side. It's called first in, first out, since the first one added will be the first one uh, that we are pulling out also. Yeah. They have a very limited set of operations, so they are considered to be the most simple data structures. We are not trying to access any element in, inside the data structure. We are always working at the ends of the data structure. Slightly more complicated is DEC, the double-ended queue, where we can add and remove at both the first side, at both sides. So we are having an operation called add first and remove first, which are pushing elements and removing elements, and add last, which are adding and removing the last element. In this sense, the most general data structure is the list. We can add and remove everywhere. Uh, they are all called sequential, since they have uh, they are always in a sequence. We can also ask, uh, give me the element at a certain position. So they are lined up starting with the first element and the last element at all times. So that's why they are called sequential data structure. And the most general one is called the list. We can uh, ask it, give me the element at this position, remove this one, insert a new element here or add it in the end. They are still uh, in a sequence, but we can make operations everywhere in the data structure. This one is the most general one. Everything we can do with a stack, we can also do with a list. Why should we not always use a list? Everything you can do with a stack, we can do with a list. Well, in theory, the fewer properties a data structure have, the more efficient can it be implemented. If it can only do two things, tricks a data structure, then we can optimize our implementation so it can do these two things very fast. The more things it can do, the more properties it has, the slower in general it will be. And as I said earlier on, a specialized structure provides a more precise model. It is a more precise statement saying that we are using a stack than saying that we are using a list. Yeah. What do I mean by a data structure? We are saying that there are three ne things needed in order to define a data structure. We need to give it a name, stack. We need to say what type of data that can be stored, for example integers, and we need 
to name a number of operations. Pull, peak, push and things like this. These are the three things needed in order to define a data structure. You should notice a data structure definition here, it doesn't say anything about how we are implementing them. So a stack and all these that I mentioned before, they are data structure because we are not describing in any way how to implement them. We're just saying their properties. They should have the following methods and the following properties. So as an example, I can say that my data structure has the name string stack. It can contain strings and then I define the operations that we have here. This is a definition of a data structure. I provide a name, I provide a data type and I'm telling what we can do with it, what type of operations it understands. But I'm not telling it how it is implemented. In Java we are almost every time using interfaces to define a data structure. In the Java library you will find a lot of interfaces called stack and queue and list. They are interfaces and they provide everything. They provide a name, they provide a number of methods and they provide uh, what type of data we are working with here. So a well documented interface provides an, interf an interface, de a definition of a data structure. Okay. Yeah, different data types. We have uh, basically three different options. We could have a fixed type, for example, string, integer, student. We can have the object type, that means everything can be added to it. And we can also use the generic type, which we have used for the array list, that when we are, we are, uh, when we are creating a new, a new instance of which we are specifying that this particular array list can only contain strings. Which one is the best? Generic is always best, that's a good idea. Why is this one not so good? Well, if, you if you're implementing carefully a list of students and then you need a list of teachers, then you have to redo all your implementation. So if we want to reuse our data structures, this is not a good option. Then these two are much better. So in general, uh, using a fixed data type is stupid since it limits the reusability. Use the two other options. Uh, implementation techniques. Array based, that means we are inside our implementation using an array to store our data. We have seen it in my examples of a, uh, of a list. We used an array and when it, we didn't fit any more elements we made it twice as large. So this is an array-based implementation. Uh, I will later on in this lecture talk about linked data structure. Uh, these two are the most important implementation techniques for sequential data structures. They have both their pros and cons. You will see that at certain operations this one is better, at other operations uh, this one is better. Uh, you can also use a more general data structure. For example, if you want to implement a stack or a queue, you can take a list as your starting point. All when people are pushing something, you are just adding it to the list. And when they are pulling something, you are removing the last element from the list. So if you want to implement or a stack in queue and you have a list, it's rather easy to implement the stack and the queue. Yeah. I will discuss these two approaches today and I will show um, their properties and you will see that which one you are using might have a large impact on how efficient and by efficient I mean both memory consumption and speed basically uh, depending on uh, the implementation technique that is used. Yeah, I will provide two implementations of this interface. Yeah. I told you earlier on that you, at, um, having a data structure for a single type is stupid, but I'm doing exactly that. Uh, I am here presenting an interface for an integer list uh, by providing a number of methods and also some kind of instructions for how to use them. I'm, tell I'm giving it a name 
I'm giving it a type and I'm giving it a number of operations with some kind of definition of what they're supposed to do here. Okay? Are you familiar with this example? Add means add at the end of the list. Add at means add them at a certain position and move the other elements one step backwards. Remove means give me the element and remove the element at a certain position. Get means just give me the element. Index of find position of integer n otherwise return minus 1 and there are a few more operations. Any questions about the, what we are about to do? do. Okay, uh, I have several times showed how to implement it using an array. If you are implementing it an array based, you need to store your values in this case in an integer array since we have an int list. So this is where I will store my values and also I have a field up here called size to keep track of the current size. That means how many elements that are stored for the time being in the list. Yeah. When we are uh, creating a new array int list, we give an, a start value. That means we are saying that the number of elements that can be stored are, is 8. And then we have the approach here that uh, I'm adding a new element, I'm inserting it. And if the size is the same as the length of this one, then it's time to grow. So then I'm asking the, uh, this one to increase its size. This is the resize method. I make a new array twice as long as the current array. I move all the elements from this array to this new one. And then I'm just updating the new one like this. I have shown this, I think, two or three times before. Do you understand how it works? Have you seen this method? We could have had the for statement iterating over all elements and moving them, but this one is a predefined method. It is slightly faster. Uh, it's a predefined method called array copy. It says we should move elements from values to temp, starting in this position in values, starting in this position in temp, and these are the number of elements to be moved from one to the other. So it's a predefined method for moving elements from one array to another. Okay, do you understand the basic idea here, how it works? Remove is a bit problematic. Uh, if I want to remove in an uh, element in an array-based operation, then I have to sh shuffle all the other elements behind it. So if I would like to remove the element of position index, then I start at index and I move all the elements on the right hand side of it one step uh, forward. So, um, we have an array here. And at a certain position we have uh, elements here. And I would like to remove this one. I do it by taking all the elements here and move them one step in this way. Uh, so uh, it is quite a bit of work. It might be that we are removing the first element and we have one million elements on the right hand side. Then we have to move all of them one step to the left. Uh, can you come up with an, another operation in the int list interface where we have the same or a similar problem? What? Add at. We should insert an element at a certain position. Then we have to take all these elements and move them one step to the right. So add, at and remove is a bit problematic uh, for the uh, array-based implementation. Can you come up with another problem with array-based implementation? Well, quite often it's only half full. We have an array which is much larger than the number of elements added. So we are somewhat wasting a bit of memory space quite often when we are using an array-based implementation. Um, I said in the int list interface that it should extend another interface. Uh, classes are implementing interfaces, but interfaces, they are extending other interfaces. And when an interface is extending another one, it simply means that we are merging them together. So uh, if we are implementing this class, we must 
implement all the methods that were specified here, but we must also implement all the methods specified in this one. So interface extending another interface, you can think of it as providing a new interface containing all methods in both these uh, interfaces. Uh, in this case, I said that our interface should extend iterable integer interface. Then we must look up what is the content of this one. We look it up in the, the Java library and we find that this interface only has one method. It says that we must have a method called iterator that returns an iterator. So basically, uh, this you can go back. This extension here, adding this one, could be I could have inserted a method down here saying iterator returns an iterator. I'm just adding one more method to the interface. Uh, and as you have seen in the previous course, uh, an uh, iterator is also an interface and this interface says that it must be a class that implements the following methods. This one is optional and seldomly used. You are forced to implement it, but in most cases you can say, throw an exception and say not, you, not implemented in this case. It's optional. Yeah. So, in my array based, okay, iterable class here. I said uh, if it is iterable, it must contain a method called iterator, and I can use it in this way. Uh, I create a new instance of my class, I'm adding a number of integers to it, I can ask it give me your iterator, and I can use this has next, next approach to iterate over it. Uh, the advantage of using iterable rather than inserting this method just into the interface is that it also allows you to use this construct. Everything that implements the iterable interface, uh, Java understands that we can also use the short version of the for statement. So I could create a new array int list, I could add elements to it here, and then I could just use this short approach uh, to pick out all the elements in the list. This is only possible for classes that are implementing uh, this interface. So if you have some class that, well, you would like to iterate over all its elements using this approach, then you must make sure that you are implementing the iterable interface. Then you have this property automatically. Uh, how do you implement iterators? Well, the most common approach is to insert a class into the, your own class. So in, my, in this case it is inside the class array int list. I must implement this method iterator. I'm just saying we are returning a new list iterator and then I have inside this class I have another class inserted. So we have we have the array int list class array int list and inside it I have a method, a, a new class uh, called list iterator here. It is a class inside another class and it is only used to handle this particular question. Yeah, so you can have classes inside other classes. I can make it separate. You can make it separate as well. But we are considering that how I am implementing this iterator, it is an implementation detail specific for this particular list. It's not supposed to be used anywhere else. Uh, this was uh, rather early, I think. Uh, let's go on for a while and then we we'll take a break later on. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, this is the introduction to the second approach for how to implement linked lists. Uh, problems with array-based implementations is, as I said earlier on, the remove method. All elements to the right must be moved one step forward, add at. All elements to the right must be moved one step backwards. And also, 
a large portion of the array might not be in use, so we are wasting memory. These are two potential problems uh, with the array-based implementation. Assume that you are using it as a queue. You are adding elements in the end and you are always removing them from the first element. Then in every remove operation you have to move all the elements one step to the left. It will make the uh, dequeue operation very slow. Uh, a linked list is another approach. Uh, we are using two classes, the list and an inner class called the node. So in this case, in this case, our implementation will roughly look like we have uh, our linked list implementation and inside it we have another class called node. And <clears throat> this is what the class will look like and this is when we are talking about objects, when it, what it will look like when we are interacting with it. The user is always interacting with, a link, with, a, with this class. We have an add method here and we have a few other methods here, but they are using this node class here to construct a chain of elements. So the list only knows about the first node in the chain. This one is called the head node. And then if we want to add one more element, we go along this chain until we find a first empty spot. Then we are creating a new node and insert it here. So a linked list contains of one object, the list object. It knows about the first node and it knows about the current size. And for each element added, we are creating a new node here. They are the links in the chain. Uh, this is important and this one is the one that you should understand. This is the key to understanding how linked lists are implemented. We have the class. We are keeping track of this current size and we are keeping track of the first node or the element in the list. This one is called head. When we are adding a new integer, we start by checking if the head is null, then we, have an em then we have an empty list. In this case, we are just creating a new node and attaching it to the head here. Think of it as linked list head. Initially this one is null. This is the starting point and size is null also. Uh, is zero also. Uh, when we are adding the first element we are checking is head equal to null? Yes it is. Then we are creating a new node insert the value 4 and we are saying that this no longer points to null, it points to the first element. We are adding the first link in the chain. Uh, we are adding a second element. Uh, head is not null in this case because it's pointing, it's pointing to the first element. So then we start here and traverse this chain of links as long as the next pointer, every node contains a next pointer, as long as this one is not null, we are moving to the next one until we find the final node in the chain where this one points to null, then we stop and say that okay from now on the last node should point to our new node and we are increasing the size. So the list knows about the first node and the current size. The nodes contains the value that we are storing, but they also know about the next node in the chain. So uh, we, when we want to insert an element, we start with a head and then we say as long as the next is not pointing to null, we are moving one step, moving one step until we find a situation where next is pointing to null, then we stop, add a new node here and connect it to next here. This is 
what goes on here. I start in the first node and as long as this one uh, is not pointing to null, I move one step forward in the chain. The new node is the next node of the previous one. So this one is stepping along the chain of nodes until this one is true. Then I stop and add a new node in the end of it. The node class is extremely simple. We have a class node. It only knows about the value and the next one in the chain. Any questions? Of how it works. Yeah? So, uh, we, we, we are not storing it somewhere, it's uh, somewhere in memory, um, just we have a link uh, next to it. The <coughs> we have two types of objects. We have the class, the link, the list class, and the node class. Uh, the and at the same time, we ha have one object of list class and many node objects. This one only knows about the first node in the chain. What I mean is, uh, we only have a link to the first one. Fr from the list, we only have a link to the first one. Well, the first one has only a link to the next, the second one, and so forth. So, in order to reach this point here, we must start here, traverse the entire list until we are realizing we have, we have reached the end of the list, and then we are adding one more element. Uh, what is the advantage of this one? Well, you will see that uh, removing elements here, we don't have to shuffle them. Uh, for example, if I should remove the first node here, all I have to do is to redirect this one to this one. I don't have to shuffle all the elements one step to the left. So certain operations, this one will be faster. Other operations, uh, adding, it's very slow. When adding a new element, we have to go through the entire list. It might be millions of elements until we find the last one. But I will show a modified version of this one later on, which fixes this problem. Yeah? Why, why, why don't you also uh, store the last element in the main list class? So yeah, this is the most... I will show this is an improvement. It's called the head and tail approach. We don't, we're not only knowing about the first one, we also keep track of the last one. It will simplify the add operation considerably. But let's start with the simplest case, and it's this one. We only know about the head node. Did you understand how this one works? In principle, get find node at a certain position and return its value, give me the element that position index. Well, I start with a head, I move index step forward in my chain. That means I start from the head, then I move index number of steps, and then I'm just returning the value of this one. So, give me the element at position 2. Okay, I start here and then I move one, two, and then I stop here and say, okay, we are returning the value of this one. So I move a certain number of steps along this chain and I return this one. Starting here, I move a certain number of steps forward. This is move forward in the chain. I stop and I return the current one. Index off. Return index of first node with a certain value. I start in the head. Uh, I move forward as long as uh, I haven't found the element. If I found the element that I'm looking for, uh, then I'm returning the index. And if I'm not finding it, I'm updating the position here. So I move along the chain look, looking for a certain element. and. Every step I take, I'm updating this one to see how many steps I've taken. If I find it, all I do is to return the current position. It will answer this question. Now, iterators, I use exactly the same approach as for the 
uh, for the array based implementation my iterator methods just returns a new uh, uh, instance of my list iterator this is an inner class I start by initializing it saying that the node should be the first node next you mean you remember next means uh, give me the next element in the list so uh, next I'm picking out the element move one step forward and return the element has next well as long as we the node is not null we have one more element to give remove throw an exception saying that it's not implemented so every call to next will return a value and step to the next chain in this uh, to the next link in this chain next has next answer have we reached the end of the uh, chain as long as we haven't reached the end of the chain this one will return true yeah. one of the weak parts uh, of a linked list is that this one is very slow the get method is very slow so if you are to iterate over a linked list you should not use this approach uh, you could do it like this start in the first position give me the size and then give me the element at position zero one two three four and each time when you're calling the get method you have to start from the beginning of the list and move backwards uh, in this case this one is much faster it doesn't restart it knows where it is and then next just move to the next pointer so if you are trying to iterate over a linked list you shouldn't use this approach you should always use the iterator approach it's much faster and much less work done in that case yeah okay remove I would like to remove let's go over here assume that I have my my linked list here it points to a first node which points which points to a second node points to a third node and so forth we have a chain here and I would like to remove this one remove the one at position two yeah. what I would like to do then is actually to, to locate this one the one before the one to be removed and then redirect this one like this then it's gone yeah so the idea is to if I would like to remove this one I should locate the node before it and then tell this one that you should no longer point to this one the next here should be this one so what I'm doing here I'm trying to find the one before I start in the head and I move index minus one steps forward then I have found this one then I'm saying the one to be deleted is the next one to the, the before I locate this one and then I'm saying that the before next before next should be the deleted next this is where I'm redirecting this one to this point did it make sense yeah Yes, uh, good question. Uh, after this operation, you agree that I have this. Yeah, I have connected the first node to the third node. So the next time I'm traversing the list, I will not notice this one. Uh, this one is actually still alive, pointing to this one, but no one is referencing this one. Uh, this is called garbage collection once in a while the java virtual machine stops take a look at all objects and ask is anyone referencing this one and if no one is referencing it it will be removed so in other languages like c 
you must remove elements, otherwise they stay there and consume memory. In Java it's not a problem. Yeah. If they are not used by anyone, the virtual machine will find them and remove them for you. So it's called, it, it will be garbage collected. Even if it points at something else? Yes, but no one is pointing to this one. That means it's impossible to reach it in the program anymore. And uh, the Java virtual machine will remove it in that case. Did you understand the basic idea? Locate the one before, redirect it like this. The idea is simple. Do you understand what, that this is what happens in here? Okay, if I should add an element. I would like to insert an element here, containing number 8. Yes? Create a new node and do what? Create a new node here. And then ask this one to go there and this one to go there. Yeah, and this is exactly what we do in the add at method. Uh, <coughs> we would like to insert it here at position index, then we should find the one before this one. So we do the same thing as we did earlier on. We take index minus one steps and locate this node. And then we are saying that the new element, we start by creating the new element up here, its next pointer should be the befores element, this one. So we are adding this edge first. At this point here we are saying that the new node's next pointer should be the pre this one's next pointer. And then we are saying that the before's next pointer should be our new element here. So we are inserting it. We are first adding this reference and then we are adding this reference. If the if it should be added first, then we must say that the new one's next pointer should be the currently number one head. And the head should be the new one. Let's go back a step. I couldn't fit in the handling here when we are removing, if I was about to remove the first element. If I'm about to remove the first element, what should I do? Make the first element the second element. No, just point at the Make the first element, yeah, that's it. But how do I do it? Setting up the head to the second element. Yeah, it's basically just to say that the new head is the old had no the new the new node had let's see we should okay we should remove the first element yeah oh well, then it was okay <laughs> it was okay I was thinking about it. Head equals head next. We are simply saying that the first element is this one. The removing any references to this one. Yeah, so this is what should be inserted here. Okay, as you said, uh, the problem with this simple approach only using a head is that every time we are adding an element I had to step through the whole list. I had to go through the entire list, it might be millions of elements until I find the last one and then I'm adding it. A very simple and quick fix is to not only keep track of the first element, the head, also to always keep track of the last element like this. So we have a head and a tail pointer now. 
And when we are adding an element, all we have to do is to say that tail next is the new node and the new, new tail is the tail next node, like this. So rather than going through all the elements, we jump directly over here and add a new element. This fixes this problem and this is, so <coughs> implementing it only using head is bad since we are adding elements all the time this is the most commonly used operations on a on a list is to add new elements to it but this simple fix using a head and tail uh, improves it so i have talked about uh, let's see if okay uh, another problem we can only traverse list in one direction. I only know about the next node in this direction. If I'm keeping a reference to this node, I cannot go backwards. I cannot, can only go in one direction along the chain of nodes. So if, for example, if I would like to print it backwards, print all the elements backwards, I would have to Start here, go to the final element and print it. And then restart here, go to the second and then print this one. So if you think that this is a problem, you can use something called a double linked list. We have a head and a tail. We have a tail and a head. But now each node knows not only about the next node, it also knows about the previous node. In that case, it's more flexible. We can traverse it in any direction, but uh, it will not happen in this course. You will see that adding something in the middle of it and removing something in the middle of it starts to get tricky here. Uh, it's easy to, we should remove this one. Then we should redirect this one like this. And we should also redirect this one like this. It's easy to mess it up. Uh, but this is the, if you're using one of the Java's predefined classes, the linked list, they are using an approach like this. So, we have presented two ways of implementing a, link, uh, a list. We have the linked approach and the array-based approach. The advantage with the linked approach is that we don't have to shuffle elements in remove and add that. We simply uh, bypass them in this case. Uh, we don't need the resizing mechanism. We don't have any wa memory wastes. We always have a num uh, exactly the same number of nodes as we have uh, for the uh, as we have elements. So no no half empty arrays that waste memory. But and this is the problem. In general, the get method is slow. We have to start from the beginning and go to position 255 or something like this. So, uh, linked approaches are very good at accessing uh, both ends of the list. So when you're implementing a queue, this is the recommended approach. And when you're implementing a stack, you can use it as well. Uh, or a deck, a double-ended queue. Uh, if you are often using the method get, uh, then probably uh, an array-based implementation is, is better. Yeah, Java, the library, contains three classes that are all implementing the list interface. Array list is array-based, linked list is a double linked one, and something called vector. This is array-based and thread-safe. What do I mean by thread-safe? Uh, we haven't discussed it yet, but if you want to do computations in parallel, we can think of it, we have only used one thread. Our execution starts here and it works like this and it takes one, uh, it, it takes one uh, uh, statement at a time. It might jump from one method to another, but they are taking all the statements. At one point you can say that I would like to start a new thread. And if you have more than one core in your machine, they will actually be uh, executed in parallel. So you start a new thread and say, okay, from now on, 
I will do these computations in one thread, but this is another set of computations that are done in parallel. The problem using this approach is if they both are accessing the same, let's say, list. This one is adding elements or removing elements from this one, and this one is doing it also. And it turns out that if they are at the same time, it might give errors. One might start to access it in a position where the other one has it really completed its operation. Yeah. A thread safe implementation of the list is one where we are, if one thread starts to access it, one, it blocks it. It says, it's mine. You cannot do it. Then this one has to wait. And this, the vector is implemented just for this purpose. It is array based, but it's also thread safe. That means every time someone starts to use it, it blocks it and says, this is mine. No one else can use it. It makes it a bit slower. So if you are not using threads, there is no reason at all to use this one. Always use array lists in most of your application, which is not threaded. Okay. So. Selecting data structure, you have a large set of data that you would like to store somewhere in your program. The first question to ask is what operations are required? What properties do I need? Then you select what type of data structure, list, queue or set, something like this. Once you have decided upon this one, then you start to ask what operations are most frequently used. For example, it is the get operation is very frequently used. Then, of course, you have a list, but then you take the array based one. So you basically decide upon the data structure in two steps. First, how should it be used? It, is, it decides what type of data structure and then for performance, what operations are most frequently used. Then you pick one type of implementation. In an upcoming lecture I will talk about sets. It's another type of data structure and it can also be implemented in two ways using hash tables and binary search trees. Uh, you must know uh, how both of them work in order to make a proper choice which one to use. So although we don't have to implement uh, the Java library comes with a number of data structures that means we don't have to implement them. However, in order to select the best one, you must know how they work. And uh, later on in the fourth assignment, you will actually measure the time to do certain operations. And then you will see it can be a factor of 1000 in speed, selecting a wrong one compared to selecting a slow one. And also, when you apply for your first job, and they want you to do some implementation and you select a stupid data structure, then you will not be hired. Uh, it means that you haven't listened to any lecture during your three years here at school, because you will hear about this all the time. And this is, will be something we call time complexity. It has to do with performance. Even if, even if you only have 100 elements, it, which is very small and doesn't well, it takes a microsecond or a nanosecond to do the operations. Still, you should always pick the best one. It shows that you are aware of uh, what's going on. Okay. Yeah. The first exercise. We provide you with a queue interface. We would like you to do a linked implementation of it and we are suggesting basically forcing you to use a head and tail approach. Using only head would be stupid. Why? Because adding new elements would be slow. If you're using a head and tail, both adding and removing elements from the queue should be done without traversing the entire list. Uh, as a second exercise, I don't have any slides for it. Um, you will be asked to do an array-based implementation of a queue. What is the problem with an array-based implementation of a queue? 
didn't we have it on the written exam? Or was didn't was it? Okay. Anyway, we have an array, and we would like to use it to construct a queue. We are always keeping track of which is the current first element and which is the current last element. When we are removing an element from the queue, we are only moving this one one step here. When we are adding a new element to the queue, we are inserting the element here and we are moving this one. Okay, this is the basic idea. What is the problem with this approach? Yeah, it, these both will slowly move in this direction. After I have added one million elements to the array and I have removed one million elements, then first and last point to position one million away there. And I have no use for this first part here. Can you come up with a better way of solving it? You can stop once in a while and shuffle them in this direction. But yeah, in the second exercise here, which is a VG exercise, we will ask you to do something called a circular array. When you are running out of space here, you move it here. Then your queue is going all the way here. And then only when last is entering, reaching first, then you redouble the size here. So in this way we can, without shuffling anything, make perfectly use of the array. Uh, the only thing is to keep track of uh, the first one will also eventually move over here and the last one will move over here. It's called a circular array. Uh, not that tricky, but yeah, it's uh, simple to make uh, a few errors, but you will find them out. And you can also Google on circular array and you will find many algorithms pointing out exactly for how you to do it. But uh, it is a VG exercise and it's a bit tricky until you get the idea. Finally, have you seen these comments? <coughs> Those that start with backslash star star and um, uh, a bit more organized uh, comments. They are called javadoc comments and they should be compared to the ordinary multi-line or block comments that looks like this. Uh, they are used, javadoc comments are used to document program code compared to the ordinary ones. They start with this one. They have a number of predefined tags with a special meaning, param return throws like this. Why do we have these? What? So that the user of a method, for example, can understand what the method does. Yeah, it's a proper documentation, but there is one more advantage. When you, like, the, the menu that appears when you press a button, when you press dot. Okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe when you put the dot, it can come with extra. But the major advantage is that... Let's go to my... Here. I have a... It is my interface for the int list. I have plenty of these comments here. I can just go to project generate java doc and then i go here and say that i'm interested in the data structure class int list and array int list and then i finish I, I decided to print out int list and array int list here it creates a new folder here containing a few html uh, pages and these are the ones let's go to int list uh, that looks like this so the entire java api that you i hope is uh, rather used to now they are generated in this approach 
you are just marking them up in a correct way, press Java doc generate comments and you will get something that looks a bit professional in the documentation style. Uh, all the methods here and all the, you can click on them here and you can get more information about them here. So if you're marking up your code in a correct way, you can immediately generate HTML documentation that looks uh, rather nice. Let's go back to my slides. So Javadoc by Javadoc can generate HTML pages for information and the Java library documentation is a nice uh, example of this one. Uh, uh, all you have to do in Eclipse is to go to project and press generate Java doc and then point out which classes that you're interested in. It also generates a lot of other information about the package structure and things like this. But, uh, 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 it generates too many pages in general, I would say, but uh, at least those that you're interested in are generated and they look nice. Uh, so, a few words. Position is important. You have your block comment here. It should be right above the method that you are documenting. Uh, you can use HTML encoding in here. For example, here I would like you to use a more of a type, old typewriter style. So you can use HTML to uh, shift the fonts that are used. There are a number of predefined tags here. Param, then you are saying a few words about the different parameters. Throws are information about uh, at what type of in, uh, uh, exception that will be thrown and also you are writing down here when it will be uh, generated. Uh, you can also uh, comment the entire class usually between import and class declaration. So I have a um, package here and then I insert here a bit information about my class. An interface representing a simple integer list, it provides support for... And then I insert a bit of space here. And then I can use a combination of ordinary HTML and these predefined tags. And I think... Mm -hmm. It was the one generating this text over here. And I had links to these two interfaces and then it was a bit about the order and see also things like this. So basically the class can be commented and each method should be commented. At least if you want to have any information about them. Usually uh, we say that each public class should be documented. Private classes is not that important. They are an implementation detail. Mm -hmm. uh, and getting started is really easy. I would recommend you download my examples. I have put together two examples, the int list uh, Java class and the array int list class. They are both documented using Java doc. Insert them into Eclipse and generate Java Docs comments. Compare my markup with what you see in the output and you will understand uh, how it works. Uh, of course, Google Java Doc and tutorial and you will find 100 tutorials explaining you how to use it. Uh, in the second uh, assignment, we will ask you to comment your queue using Java Doc and also to generate the corresponding HTML pages and insert them as a part of your submission. I think that's it for today. We did it slightly more than an hour. Any questions related to this one? Okay, uh, see you on Wednesday. Good luck with your programming. <laughs> <laughs>